on World News Tonight. Wagner deployed. Hardened mercenaries join the war in Ukraine. This comes after Moscow announced a strategic shift in military forces. What more will Ukraine have to face? Find out tonight. Shelling continues. Many in Ukraine are still facing the brunt of Russia's ruthless attacks even after announcements of scaling back. Residential areas are being hit relentlessly and residents are rushed to find shelters. War impact. The war in Ukraine is leading the whole world to face an economic crisis leading to massive inflation rates and scarcity of goods. How far will this continue? More news on this tonight. Shalitas in action. La Paz celebrates with indigenous women wrestlers for a street party that merges Indonesian Ayamara culture with modern Bolivia. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Tonight we're leading with more distressing updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia's Wagner Group has deployed its mercenaries to eastern Ukraine. The UK's Ministry of Defense said, adding that over 1,000 would likely take part in fighting following Russian setbacks. Reputed to be close to President Vladimir Putin, the Wagner Group and its mercenaries are suspected of abuses in Mali, Libya and Syria. Hardened mercenaries joining in the war on Ukraine the British Defence Ministry says more than a thousand fighters from Russian private military contractor the Wagner Group are being deployed to the country, notably around the northeastern city of Kharkiv and in the eastern Donbass region. The report comes after Moscow announced a strategic shift in its now month-long invasion, ostensibly abandoning its goal of conquering all of Ukraine to focus on control of the Donbass. That would be a familiar setting for the Wagner Group. The firm first rose to prominence in 2014, fighting alongside pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass as they launched a Moscow-backed war of secession from Kiev. With an estimated 2,500 to 5,000 mercenaries from both Russia and abroad, Wagner has been nicknamed Putin's private army, though the Russian president refuses to even acknowledge its existence. Its operatives have appeared in some dozen conflict zones around the world where the Kremlin has a strategic interest, fighting alongside the Syrian National Army in the country's civil war, supporting rebel general Khalifa Haftar in Libya, and providing security to embattled presidents in Venezuela and the Central African Republic. The group's methods, meanwhile, have alarmed the UN and several NGOs, with Wagner contractors accused of carrying out executions rapes and torture in the course of their missions. Ukrainian authorities said that Russian forces had bombarded the northern city of Chernihiv, despite Moscow's earlier claims that it was radically scaling back military activity in the area. The enemy has demonstrated its decrease in activity in the Chernihiv region with strikes on Nizhyn, including airstrikes. Burned out stalls still smoldering. This is what's left of a market in Chernihiv in northern Ukraine after it was shelled overnight. Local authorities said Russia targeted several civilian buildings in this city on the heels of Moscow's commitments to scale back its assault here. Chernihiv and the surrounding region has been bombed relentlessly since the war began five weeks ago. The enemy has demonstrated its decrease in activity in the Chernihiv region with strikes on Nizhyn, including airstrikes. Chernihiv was shelled all night. It's the same story around the capital, Kiev. There are few signs of any withdrawal of Russian troops, and air raid sirens are constantly ringing. Here, too, in the wake of Russia's assurances, residential areas have been hit repeatedly. Ukrainian authorities said two days ago that they'd taken back Irpin, a suburb to the west of Kiev, but there's been no end to the explosions. These residents have just been evacuated after four weeks of hiding out in the middle of the fighting. We're from Irpin. We've been there since the beginning of the strikes, until today. We were hiding in the cellar of a house opposite our own home. Then a shell hit the house, it burned down. Only the cellar remained intact. On the eastern front, near the border with Russia, the Ukrainian army is resisting. It claims to have regained control of a strategic highway leading to Kharkiv, the country's second city. In the southeast, the destroyed port city of Mariupol is still under siege. 
On Wednesday, a Red Cross facility was targeted by Russian airstrikes and artillery. SpaceX's internet service Starlink is available in Ukraine now and more terminals are being sent to the country. This was a move taken by the owner of the company, Elon Musk. Orbiting hundreds of kilometers above the Earth, these satellites are playing a role in the Ukraine war. The Starlink satellite network, owned by billionaire Elon Musk, has been providing the country with internet service. It all started with a tweet at the end of February by the Ukrainian vice prime minister asking Musk to help. A few hours later, the service was operational in Ukraine, with Starlink satellites positioned over the country and the ground terminals being delivered by truck. Ukrainians could again connect to the Internet, even in cities that were being heavily shelled. This satellite connection also allows Ukrainian drones to locate and precisely target Russian tanks. With the Starlink network, the drones transmit the precise GPS coordinates of the tanks to the artillery, even if the soldiers are located several kilometers away. Once the information is received, then the target can be hit. It's proved an effective tool against Russian forces. In this video, a Ukrainian drone pilot thanks Elon Musk. Thank you, Elon. Glory to Ukraine. The company says it has sent hundreds of Starlink satellite terminals to Ukrainians since the invasion last month. The entire world is part and partially affected by skyrocketing inflation and scarcity of goods. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez unveiled plans to offer 16 billion euros in direct aid and loans for families and companies hit by the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Rising prices and rising discontent. Spain is in the midst of its worst bout of inflation since 1985. Consumer prices for the month of March up 9.8 percent compared to a year earlier. February's inflation figure was already at 7.6 percent. At its core, soaring energy costs, which have been on the rise since last year. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, though, oil and gas prices have spiked further, as has the cost of food. Under pressure, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is taking action. Un plan. Our plan is for 6 billion euros of investment by June the 30th via direct aid and tax cuts, along with the more than 10 billion euros in loans to soften the consequences of this crisis on families, businesses and the most vulnerable organizations. That 16 billion euro plan includes a 20 cent per litre discount at the fuel pump, a 362 million euro package for the agriculture sector, 68 million euros for fishermen and a cap on rent increases of 2 percent over the next three months. With advanced liquid natural gas facilities and an already high proportion of renewable energy, Spain and Portugal are less dependent on Russian gas than many EU member states, but they're also far less connected to the continent's energy grid. That reality convinced EU leaders on Friday to allow an Iberian exception to the bloc's electricity pricing rules. The two countries are expected to announce a special proposal in the coming days to cap gas prices in a bid to bring down skyrocketing electricity costs. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan is facing arguably the biggest challenge of his political career as the opposition seeks to remove him from office in a vote of no confidence. The country's lawmakers will convene to begin debating the motion as Mr Khan's future appears to be hanging by a thread. In recent days, there has been a flurry of activity and what some argue were tactics straight out of Michiavelli's playbook, which resulted in several Khan allies deserting his Pakistan tariq e insaf or PTI party, tilting the scales firmly in the opposition's favour. A simple majority of 172 in the 342-seat National Assembly against the former cricket legend would cut short his tenure as PM. The magic number was breached with his main coalition ally, the MQM. The magic number was breached when his main coalition ally, the MQM, joined the opposition. It means on paper the opposition now commands 175 votes to the government's 164. Imran Khan, elected in July 2018, vowing to tackle corruption and fix the economy, isn't going quietly. He hosted a massive rally on Sunday in Islamabad to show how he remains wildly popular with his supporters.
Thundering against his arch rivals, three time Premier Nawaz Sharif and Asif Zardari, husband of the murdered PM Benazir Bhutto, Mr. Khan also waved a letter at the adoring crowd alleging it contained evidence of a foreign conspiracy in cahoots with corrupt thieves aiming to topple his government. He has yet to reveal the letter's contents despite repeated promises. Adding to the drama, his address to the nation was postponed without explanation. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The Biden administration is stepping back from one of the president's campaign pledges, embracing a long-standing U.S. policy of using the threat of a potential nuclear response as a means of deterring conventional and other non-nuclear dangers in addition to nuclear ones. U.S. President Joe Biden has walked away from what he said was his longtime preferred policy of, quote, no first use of nuclear weapons. According to the 2022 nuclear posture review submitted to the U.S. Congress by the Pentagon, Washington would consider the use of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances to defend the vital interests of the country as well as its allies and partners. The report, however, did not elaborate on the conditions it describes as, quote, extreme circumstances. During the 2020 campaign, Biden endorsed the idea of a no-first-use policy, meaning the U.S. would launch a nuclear weapon only in response to a nuclear attack. This, however, was met with concerns from Europe and other U.S. allies. Biden's policy shift could have been impacted by the increased possibility of Russia's use of nuclear arms against Ukraine, signs of an imminent nuclear test by North Korea, and China's massive nuclear expansion. The three-paragraph summary also states the U.S. is committed to reducing the role of nuclear weapons. It also explains the U.S. will seek to reduce its nuclear arsenal, starting with a new missile introduced under the former Trump administration. The Pentagon asked a full classified version of the report would be made available in the near future. Envoys of the UN and US welcomed unilateral truce moves by Yemen's warring sides as encouraging steps while stressing the need for a more comprehensive ceasefire. United Nations and United States envoys have welcomed unilateral truces called by both of Yemen's warring sides. The Saudi-led coalition said it would temporarily halt military operations from Wednesday. That was after the Iran-aligned Houthis declared a three-day cessation of cross-border attacks and ground offensives. It's the most significant step in peace efforts for more than three years. Seven years of war have killed tens of thousands in Yemen and pushed millions into hunger. The UN had called for a truce during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which starts this week. The UN and US envoys stressed the need for a more comprehensive ceasefire, speaking at talks hosted by Saudi Arabia of allied factions. The Houthis say they will only attend talks if they are held in a neutral country. This was the UN's special envoy to Yemen, Hans Grundberg, in Riyadh on Wednesday. I have been encouraged by the enthusiastic participation of Yemeni political parties, components, experts and civil society representatives in this process. Across the plurality of voices, a common message has emerged. Yemenis want the war to end, and they want a just and durable peace. U.S. Special Envoy Tim Lenderking told the gathering in Riyadh that the unilateral announcements were a step in the right direction. The two envoys have been pressing Riyadh to ease coalition sea and air restrictions on areas held by the Houthis, who ousted the Saudi-backed government from the capital Sana'a in late 2014, prompting the coalition to intervene months later. They have also urged the Houthis to end an offensive in energy-producing Marib, the internationally recognized government's last stronghold in North Yemen. A permanent ceasefire has proved elusive, with both sides resisting compromise. The conflict is largely seen as a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. In a State of the Nation address, Ghana's President Nana Akufo Addo deplored recent coups in West Africa and announced that a national vaccine institute will be set up. Ghana will start producing its own COVID-19 vaccines, President Nana Akufo Addo announced on Wednesday. Though there is a bit of a wait. In a State of the Nation address, Akufo Addo said the plan would be achieved by setting up a national vaccine institute. <laughs> to begin the first phase of commercial production in January 2024. A bill 
will shortly be brought to you in this house for your support and approval for the establishment of the National Vaccine Institute. Most remaining coronavirus restrictions in Ghana were lifted over the weekend, with the government citing rapidly declining infections and a relatively successful inoculation campaign. Ghana has so far vaccinated around 21.4% of its population. Akufo Addo, who chairs regional bloc ECOWAS, also deplored a string of coups that have taken place across West Africa over the past 18 months. West African region is suddenly back with the international news headlines for all the wrong reasons. We're back again is the region of political instability and the place for criminals. The governments of Mali, Burkina Faso and Guinea have all been toppled since August 2020. Regional leaders are seeking to hasten a return to constitutional order through sanctions and ultimatums. A U.S. astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts safely landed in Kazakhstan after leaving the International Space Station aboard the same capsule, despite heightened antagonism between Moscow and Washington over the conflict in Ukraine. A U.S. astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts bid farewell to fellow crew members aboard the International Space Station on Wednesday before boarding the capsule for their return to Earth. NASA's Mark Vandehei, who had completed his second ISS mission, logged a U.S. space endurance record of 355 consecutive days in orbit, surpassing the previous 340-day record set by astronaut Scott Kelly in 2016. Touchdown. Touchdown confirmed at 6.28 a.m. Central Time, 7.28 a.m. Eastern Time, 5.28 p.m. at the landing site. And NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei now out of the Soyuz spacecraft. Vandehei smiled and waved as rescuers removed him from the capsule and medics checked his vital signs. Russia's space agency chief wrote on Telegram, quote, the crew is feeling good after landing. The flight carrying Vandehei and Russians Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov had been closely watched to determine whether escalating tensions between the two former Cold War adversaries on Earth had spilled over into long-time cooperation in space. U.S. sanctions on Russia included high-tech export restrictions aimed at degrading its rival's aerospace industry. Russia's space agency chief responded that his country would no longer supply or service Russian-made rocket engines to two NASA contractors. NASA, for its part, has said that U.S. and Russian ISS crew members were well aware of events on Earth, but were working professionally together without tension. The three who returned Wednesday were replaced by three Russian cosmonauts who joined the ISS earlier this month, joining three Americans and one German in orbit. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Chris Rock has made his first public appearance since Will Smith slapped him during Sunday night's Oscar ceremony. Hosting the latest leg of his US tour in Boston, the comic told fans that he is still processing what happened. Rock, who was greeted with a standing ovation by fans, also denied some reports in US media that he had spoken to Smith since the incident. South Korean auto giant Hyundai Motor was number one worldwide in January February in sales of hydrogen vehicles overtaking Toyota, thanks to sales of Hyundai's new model, the Nexo. President-elect Yoon suk yeol will meet young people at the Korea International Trade Association to hear their voices. Yoon will meet young people working in the trade industry to encourage them and stress the need to eliminate obstacles for small and medium-sized exporters. Eager to go on holiday and put the memories of lockdowns behind, more than a thousand South Koreans have snapped up tour packages for Hawaii. Recent polls showed people are less worried about catching the virus and increasingly see its prevention as out of their hands. Die-hard franchise star Bruce Willis is to retire from his acting career after being diagnosed with aphasia, a disease that is impacting his cognitive abilities. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. Cholita wrestlers helped ring in celebrations in La Paz for a street party that merges indigenous Aymara culture with modern Bolivia. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of indigenous women wrestlers becoming a mainstay at Electro Press Day celebrations. Thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>